DIA Media, Canada's top black media provider. Whether you look for content on fashion, art, music, or simple lifestyle, we bring you the best the black community in Ottawa has to offer, and so much more. And better yet, do you have a project to be helped with? Well, look no further. We provide equipment, studio, and office space, as well as a team of dedicated individuals to help you bring those ideas to life. So don't wait. Check out our new website at biamedia.ca for more information on how to contact us and start creating today. BIA Media, your media, your way. Good morning, and welcome to our first session in our course, What History Left Out Part Two, uh, African World History from uh 711 ce i meant to change that probably go back a little bit further we'll do some overlap with our last course uh to 1896. i'm dr clyde ledbetter jr uh this course is brought to you by jock combat in collaboration with bia media here in ottawa um and as you saw from the promo this is the spot where you can come to get all your media needs met if you're into podcasting if you're into uh radio production, TV shows, photography, anything you need for your event, uh, for your organization, contact BIA Media right here at 235 Montreal Road. So uh, what are we doing here? So if you're new to our courses, and I do this introduction every time we start a new course, um, how our format works. So our sessions are recorded. So if you ever miss a session, uh, you'll have access to the recordings. I lecture for about 25 minutes, then we take a recorded Q&A, then I lecture for another 25, 30 minutes, and then we have open discussion at the end. Uh, some of that open discussion is recorded, then we turn the recording off and have uh, more open discussion. So if you don't uh, uh, want to be recorded, save your questions to the very end and they won't be recorded, or your comments and they won't be recorded. But everything up until that point is recorded. So always remember that and will be shared uh, on various platforms, uh, social media, YouTube, um, so we can get this information out to as many people as possible. And as always, if you ever miss a lecture, we have our course website where you can get all the recordings from previous lectures that we've done, um, as well as the course materials, readings, videos, uh, different things, primary sources associated with the information that we're gonna talk about today. So this is the uh, fourth or fifth time that we've run this course. So this series, of course, is the Sankofa African History Courses, uh, community courses have been running since 2018. So we're entering our fifth year and we're gonna try to stay as consistent as possible uh, to provide you this information always for free. There's no charge for any of this, no charge for lectures, no charge for the course website. All we ask is if, you, if it's on your heart, if you wanna donate, you can feel free to donate. That money goes toward uh, providing uh, materials for youth, textbooks for youth, as well as uh, funds to support our teaching assistance when we have those. We have the Coppin African Teachers Institute where we teach young people, high school students and college students, the art and science of teaching African world history. And in fact, one of the alumni of that program, uh, Miss Nana uh, Bowen is on uh, as the TA for today. As those of you who are regulars, you know, Daniel's the permanent TA, but he's not here today. And we have a great feeling. This is a student uh, who's about to graduate from the University of Ottawa. Uh, she is an emerging expert in the fields of theology, African history, um, social justice, uh, a very, uh, uh, very um, prominent rising scholar. Uh, who will be going to graduate school somewhere very soon. So I'm glad that she's on. She's the one letting you in. So you can feel free to thank Nana uh, when you can in the chat. So uh, as we go through these lectures, um, you can write questions in the chat. You can make comments in the chat. And you can also raise your hand to ask questions when we have the Q&A. Um, and I won't be addressing the chat uh, until we stop. So uh, just keep that in mind. All right, let's get right into it. So it's January, today is the 14th. Tomorrow is January 15th, which is actually the birthday of Martin Luther King Jr., which is really important um, for us as African people, one of our great icons. Uh, but this is what they're doing in Philadelphia and a lot of places around the United States for Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday, which is the national holiday, which is uh, falls on Monday. Uh, they have these things called Martin Luther King Days of Service, and this is a 
current picture from the Philadelphia Tribune. And you see it's black family and they're picking up trash in their community. And there's a lot of events like this where people go paint schools and pick up trash and do different things to honor the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. Now, this is cool, but we really got to step back as African people, as students of history and say, is this really the best way to honor Martin Luther King Jr.? The revolutionary, the nonviolent revolutionary, the theologian, the activist. Dr. King would love to see beautiful neighborhoods like we all would, and this is you know great work, but Dr. King's legacy is more about action. Dr. King's legacy is more about confronting injustice, confronting exploitation. And it's important for us to remember that so we actually use his day to do those things. Because there's a lot of injustice still in the world. There's a lot of liberation that still needs to be accomplished. And King would want us to do that. And in fact, this goes to what we're talking about with these courses, which is the use of history as a tool for liberation. This is what uh, Walter Rodney reminded us about back in 1968, uh, not long after King was assassinated. If we truly know history and we truly use it for what it's meant to be used for, for African people, for liberation, then we would know King probably wouldn't want us doing this, at least not on his birthday. He probably would want us doing something else. So it's incumbent upon us to really investigate King's history and the history of so many of our great people and events and movements, because if not, we'll have a generation come up to think Dr. King was a janitor, <laughs> that Dr. King was somebody that all he cared about was cleaning up communities. And that's not it. We can't let our, our history be watered down. We can't let our history be told to us in a way that uh, you know takes the teeth out of our heroes. So I want to talk a little bit about King before we get started into the material that we're we'll talking about today. And it all connects. One of the things that uh, <clears throat> our enemies of Black progress have done with King is that they've rendered him to the eye of a dream speech. And this is what all people know, uh, uh, this is what people know about King. You ask any young person on the street about Dr. King, they say, oh, this guy have a dream. And then even with that, it's not even the whole speech. It's just it's the, the end part of the speech. But King wrote several books. And probably his most important text is the last one he wrote, Where Do We Go From Here, Community of Chaos, which was published a year before he uh, was assassinated in 1967. And King presents himself a little different than how the media and, and you know, mainstream uh, uh, propaganda presents King. King said this, and this is really important for us in 2023. A second important step that the Negro must take is to work passionately for group identity. This does not mean group isolation or group exclusivity. It means the kind of group consciousness that Negroes need in order to participate more meaningfully at all levels of life in our nation. Group unity necessarily involves group trust and reconciliation. One of the most serious effects of the Negro's damaged ego has been his frequent loss of respect for himself and for other Negroes. He ends up with a kind of ambivalence toward his own kind. To overcome this tragic conflict, it will be necessary for the Negro to find a new self-image. And this is what we're doing in this class. We're using history for that reconciliation that King is talking about, to promote group identity. Group identity among African people all over the world, because this history class goes all over the world. We have people that tune in from all over the world. We're broadcasting from Ottawa, but we bring in folks from all over the world to promote this group identity. And King practiced what he preached. So this was written in 1967, but even as far back as King's first emergence on the world scene, he was practicing this group unity. And it wasn't just with African Americans. King was an internationalist. King was, in some respects, a pan-Africanist. We already talked in our last class, in our Shiro's class, about King's correspondence with the mother of the Angolan Revolution, uh, Dolores Rodriguez, how, who uh, uh, corresponded with King when she was in Brazil. We also got this image here, where King is meeting with Tom and Boya, 
one of the nationalists from the Kenyan struggle. And this was all the way back in 1959. And you see King, you see Abernathy, uh, King's you know, right-hand man in the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. I'm not sure who the other people are in this picture. That might be Benjamin Mays uh, to the right of King, but I'm not 100% sure. But this is at the airport in Atlanta where they're hosting Tom and Boy. And this is 1959. Kenya's still fighting for independence. Uh, King is right in the middle of the civil rights struggle. And they're uniting these struggles. And they, they had a uh, African freedom breakfast where Tom and Boya spoke in Atlanta at the universe, at Atlanta University. Uh, and King spoke as well. And then after this meeting, King wrote to Tom and Boya, uh, uh, digitized King letters that you can find uh, at uh, Stanford University's website. So if you Google uh, King letters, Stanford University, you can find a lot of King's correspondences with various African leaders. African activists uh, and international uh, figures, as well as local figures in, in the struggle. But this is what King wrote to Tom and Boyer. He said, thank you for your very kind comments concerning my book, Strive to, Stride Toward Freedom, another one of King's books that everybody should read. This one was written about the experience of the Montgomery bus boycott. And this is uh, you know, right after King becomes a national international figure. Uh, this book, is simply my humble attempt to bring moral and ethical principles to bear on the, conf on the difficult problem of racial injustice which confronts our nation. I am happy to know that you found it helpful. I am absolutely convinced that there is no basic difference between colonialism and segregation. I'm gonna read that again because that's really important when we talk about that group unity. I am absolutely convinced that there is no basic difference between colonialism and segregation. They are both based on a contempt for life and a tragic doctrine of white supremacy. So our struggles are not only similar, they are in a real sense one. King connected the struggle of African Americans, of African Canadians, of Africans in Latin America, Africans in the Caribbean, with the struggles of Africans on the continent. He said, this is the same struggle, the struggle against colonialism, it's the same thing. This is what Malcolm X would say in 1964 when he went to Africa. And there's so many connections between Malcolm and Martin, but we'll explore those in April because we'll have a whole seminar on Malcolm X and Martin Luther King in April. So stay tuned for that. But I, I start with this because this is the king that I want you all to become more familiar with. The king that had his eye toward Africa, his eye, his heart, and his writing. He writes about Africa, he writes about the struggle in Algeria, he writes about the struggles in Kenya and different places on the continent. So this is the king that we should, we should remember as we go into his birthday celebration this weekend. Um, and Tom and Boya, another important figure, Kenyan nationalist. Neither one of these men would live to be 40 years old. They both were assassinated uh, at the age of 39. King in 68, Tom and Boya in 69, but their legacies live on. As we know from African culture and African spirituality, death is not like the end of things, it's just a transition. And these men have become incredibly more powerful as ancestors, but it's incumbent on us to remember their true legacies and not let their uh, 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 missions be uh, watered down to you know, one speech or one idea about who these men were. So we're gonna talk about Tom and Boya's uh, homeland today, because we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about East Africa. Uh, and we're going to start our course differently than how we've started in the past. Usually when I start part two of our course in 7-Eleven, I start in North Africa and I talk about the Moors entering Spain. We're gonna talk a little bit about that, but I wanted to have more of an African conversation today before we start talking about African interactions with other people. We'll get into that a little bit at the end of the class today, but I really wanted to stay in Africa. So starting with Central and East Africa is a good place to start. Uh, so we'll talk about today the characteristics of life in the Bantu Swahili city-states. And then we'll, if we have time, we'll talk about the development of the African diaspora in Asia. So what exactly are we studying in this class? We're talking about African history uh, from, for about a thousand years, from around 800 to uh, 1800, 1896 is where we'll stop. We'll stop at the Battle of Ottawa, uh, where the Ethiopians defeated the Italians. And this class is all about evidence. And Everything we talk about in this class can be traced to some piece of primary evidence. I'm going to spend a lot of time over the next couple of weeks talking about evidence because it's so important for history. History is like, when you make historical claims, it's like making legal claims. 
you got to have evidence to back it up or else you're just talking. And there's a lot of information out there now uh, on YouTube, various places online where people talking about history, talking about different things, but they lack evidence. And they never tell you what their sources are, where they're getting this information from. We're not going to be like that in this class. I want you to guys to be good students of African history and always ask the question, where is the evidence? How did the authors uh, uh, support the claims that they're making about African history. Because for a long time, the idea floating around academia, the idea floating around the world, particularly uh, during slavery and, and at the decades and centuries after slavery ended, was that Africa had no history. And they presented very little evidence to back that up. But then African scholars and, and European scholars and Asian scholars said, no, let's let's look into this. And they started to rediscover the evidence for African history. So that's what we're going to do. Um, what are we relying on in this class? Well, first, let me go back. Uh, if you want the information, this link will be put, uh, will be shared with you, will share with you in the registration email as well, where you can get all the information uh, about the sources and documents and the pre-recorded lectures that we've had from this website, uh, not only for this course, but all the other courses that we've run. Our evidence for these centuries that we're going to discuss over the next seven weeks. Written evidence, of course, the written record. That's the first place people usually go. Well, did someone write about these events that we're talking about? So we have various sources of written record. We got, uh, uh, for the time period that we're in, we're not going to be dealing with a lot of Metanetra, which is the ancient Egyptian script that the Greeks called hieroglyphics. It's not really for this class. That's for the previous class. Uh, and the Meroweg script we already talked about. Uh, Giz. Uh, Phoenician, Hebrew, Latin, Greek, and Arabic. Primarily Arabic and Greek and African languages written in Arabic will be a lot of the written sources for the early period. As we go later on into the 14th, 15th, uh, 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, we'll get more English sources, French sources, Portuguese sources, Spanish sources, etc. cetera. Uh, but these are the written sources. Oral history is another key component of the evidence that we'll use to recreate these centuries. Many African nations, peoples, and ethnicities didn't write. And writing is not a marker of civilization the way some European scholars had attempted to put it. They say, well, if people don't write, they're not civilized. No, the writing is just uh, something people use for administrative purposes. It's not a marker of intelligence. It's not a marker of civilization. We know the great lengths that African oral historians uh, went to to maintain, record, and pass along African history. And uh, people like Jan Vecina and others, he's a scholar, a scholar of Central Africa, have shown how we can reconstruct oral history to help us uh, align or help us to better understand African history and align it with these other sources to get a more complete picture. So we could take the written history, we can check it against the oral history, and then we can use the archaeological record to back a lot of this stuff up. Written history can only go back so far. Oral history can only go back so far. Um, but the good thing about these first two sources, they tell you a human story. They tell you about the emotions. They tell you about human interactions. And the more you get into this history, the more that you'll find that human beings, no matter how much we develop technologically, we're ultimately the same as we were as our, uh, as our ancestors thousands of years ago. The same motivations, love, jealousy, greed, desire for power, desire for justice. These things have been with us for, for centuries. And you see that in these records. But when we get to the archeological record, it takes us back a lot further, but it doesn't tell us these stories in the same way as the oral and the, the, the written history. But it can tell us valuable information. It could tell us about social hierarchies in communities. It could tell us about the spread of technology, the spread of goods, the interactions between communities. It could tell us about social conflict. It could tell us about times of peace. It could tell us so many different things. So we rely on that. Linguistic evidence, botanical evidence. We can study the remains of plants. We can study uh, genetically. Genetics have become a very important part of the reconstruction of African history. So we're bringing in all types of sciences, chemistry, biology, uh, um, uh, genealogy, which is you know uh, uh, not a physical science, uh, genetics, um, 
even things like thermoluminescence uh, studies, where we could take a clay pot and, and, and measure the amount of heat that's left. There's so many different things that we can do to reconstruct African history. So all this to say, and I know you might be thinking, why are we spending so much time talking about this? Because I want you all to be able to pick up a book, pick up, watch a video where someone's talking about history and say, oh, this person knows what they're talking about. They've presented their evidence. They've presented where they got the evidence and how it goes to reconstruct what they're talking about. So always look for the evidence. Always ask that question. All right. Um, let's move on. So what we're talking about today, we're going to talk about the Bantu migration, which is something that we started talking about in our part one of this course. This was the migration of African people from what's now Nigeria and Cameroon, all the way through the rainforest of Central Africa, down into Southern Africa, and ultimately into East Africa. This was a migration that started around, uh, give or take, uh, 3000 BCE, and kind of ended up in the period that we're talking about now. Very important, because this is the basis of the Swahili city-states on the East African coast. Um, if you're following along in a textbook, this is a textbook that I recommend uh, for this class. If you, you can get it off of Amazon, I don't know Kevin Shillington, I don't work for Kevin Shillington, but I can honestly say it's a good text. It's one that I used in university, um, and it's one that I recommend. And this is the, the current edition, the fourth edition, History of Africa by Kevin Shillington. It's on Amazon, it's probably about $30 or $40, but it's a nice general history uh, uh, textbook for Africa. And the information that we're talking about today comes from chapter eight. Um, all right, so where we left off in class. Uh, in part one, we talked about the rise of the kingdom of Aksum. We talked about its importance in this part of the world. Um, we talked about when the, and Aksum is currently Ethiopia and Eritrea, when this kingdom controlled parts of Southern Arabia, we talked about that. We talked about the emergence of Islam and the role that the kingdom of Aksum played in that, uh, you know, around the time of the year of the uh, birth of the prophet Muhammad and the year of the elephant and now the, uh, one of the generals of the king of Aksum almost attacked the Kaaba during the year that Muhammad was born. We talked about all of that and we talked about how once the Arabs uh, received Islam and united, that kind of started to change things in this region. But there were things going on in Africa as well, and the Bantu migration was one of them. So all of this is happening at the same time. Um, and these uh, East African states, which is what we'll focus on today, uh, from Mogadishu down to Safala and, and uh, uh, Mozambique, were affected by the Arabs uniting under Islam. So the Bantu people, who came from this region of Africa, right around here, all the way down through the rainforest, down into South Africa, and ultimately into East Africa, bringing technology, bringing their culture, their language, their philosophy, um, interacting with the peoples that were already there. Very important human migration. Um, you see another map representing that. So you see 3000 BC all the way up to 1100, uh, AD or CE is when this migration was taking place. And you see the people that were already in these areas of Africa who the Bantu interacted with, who they exchanged ideas with. I want, I'm spending so much time talking about the Bantu migration because it's really important for African people to know. And it's something that we rarely talk about as one of the most important events in African world history. From this migration, 500 languages have emerged. So many kingdoms and ethnicities all with this root somewhere near Nigeria and, and Cameroon. From this area, they spread out to the rest of Africa. And what's magical about this migration, from the oral history, from the written history, from the archeological record, we see a migration of mutual exchange and cooperation. It's not a story that's often told in human history. Usually when people migrate, there's violence, um, there's conquering, there's all types of uh, man's inhumanity to man on display. But we don't see this with the Bantu migration. Now, talking about evidence. If evidence emerges, if there's some archeological discovery somewhere in 
uh, Angola, let's say, as, and then there's a evidence of a widespread war of Bantu folks coming in with their iron weapons and just slaughtering uh, the settlers, the people that were already on the land, then we had to change the narrative. We had to say, well, the Bantu migration wasn't as cooperative and mutual as we thought, but that hasn't emerged yet. So what we know from the evidence is when this happened, African people exchanged ideas. When the Bantu uh, interacted with the Batwa, the people of uh, short stature throughout East and Central Africa, they exchanged ideas, they intermarried, they taught each other. The Twa taught them how to survive in the forest. The Bantu brought in farming techniques and iron technology. When they in, interacted with the Kush, Kushik people, uh, the anthropologists called Kushite people uh, that were uh, uh, indigenous to the Great Lakes region who were already engaged in cattle producing and, and, and uh, millet farming and that type of thing, the Bantus exchanged uh, uh, technology and techniques with them and learned from them, which allowed them to expand further into East Africa and then further south down along the East African coast. So this is a beautiful migration to study. And one of the key modern scholars that studies this migration is Dr. Blair uh, Rose Zaid. She's at the University of Nebraska. She might actually be at uh, University of Michigan now. But she just got her PhD uh, four year, well, almost four years ago uh, out of the uh, Michigan State University. And her dissertation was called In Search of Homeland, Bantu Expansion as Pre-Modern African Diaspora. And I love her dissertation. I put a link to it on our course website because what she talks about is when the Bantu moved from their homeland in uh, Nigeria, and this wasn't a continuous migration with fits and stops and going back and forth, but she says they maintained aspects of a common connection through their language, through their philosophy, through their culture, through the food they ate, through the pottery they created. We see this, it, it, it was, and it was a conscious historical uh, 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 remembrance of all of the various travels and, and experiences that they've been through on this trek. This is a beautiful dissertation. She is an archeologist and anthropologist with a degree in African and African-American studies. This is a scholar that you should definitely uh, look out for. She also writes children's books as well. She's a multi-talented scholar, but yeah, she's contemporary. So you can look her up uh, if you're interested in learning more about the Bantu migration. Once the Bantus enter the East African coast, they set up shop as first as fisher people. So they master uh, coastal fishing. Then they start interacting with folks coming from Madagascar. And then people coming from India and Indonesia, various sailors that take advantage of the monsoon winds. And by the time we get to the first century CE, we're hearing reports about this land called Azania. So the Bantu people at this point have established themselves on the East African coast. And they've built these trading towns where they're taking their farming techniques, their cattle raising, their expert mastery of, of coastal fishing. And they're trading those resources with folks that are coming to Africa from Asia, from the Persian Gulf, and even from parts of North Africa. Egypt, um, Sudan as well. And this is all written about in an anonymously written Greek text. Even though the text was written in Egypt, in Alexandria, Egypt, it was written in Greek because that was the lingua franca of the time. And it's called uh, The Periplus of the Erythrean Sea or The Travels in the Indian Sea is what this is called. And it talks about these towns. Um, this book by Robert O. Collins, Documents from the African Past, is another great little book that you could have in your collection, where it has a number of primary sources from different travelers, uh, writers, explorers, who came to Africa throughout the centuries. And one of the first uh, documents in this book is a translation of this text, which talks about the people in Azania. And I'll just read a little bit uh, of it. You see, the, the, the anonymous writer writes, the uh, men of great stature inhabit the whole coast, and at each place they've set up chiefs. Uh, the people of uh, Mazua hold it in tribute under uh, the sovereignty of one of these chiefs. And they are small ships with mostly Arab captives and crews who trade and intermarry with the mainlanders of all the places and know their language. This is the beginnings of the Swahili city coast. You got Bantu folks 
who have set up these areas, these trading air, uh, 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 cities, and travelers, Arab travelers, Indonesian travelers, Chinese travelers, Indian travelers, all making their way to the coast, intermarrying, exchanging cultures. But the basis of all of this is a Bantu culture. Swahili is a Bantu language. So it's a language that shares similarities with people all the way on the other side and further north in Africa, Nigeria and Cameroon. So very important. Um, in those market towns are imported lances made especially for them, hatchets, swords, axes, and many kinds of small glass vessels. In some places, wine, and not a little wheat, not for trade, but to gain the goodwill of and the writer, of course, shows the ethnocentricity of the barbarians. So he calls the people barbarians. <laughs> uh, much ivory is taken away from these places, but it is inferior to quality to that of Adelis, which is in Ethiopia. So it's saying Ethiopian ivory is a better quality. Uh, and also rhinoceros horn, tortoise shells, uh, different from that of India, and a little coconut oil. And these, I think, are the last of the market towns of Azania. So when you hear the name Azania, this is where it comes from. This was a name actually taken by revolutionaries in South Africa for uh, what they wanted South Africa to be called after apartheid, which was Azania. So you have the Pan-African Congress of Azania, the Azania People's Liberation Army, so on and so forth. It's one of the very early names associated with this. From this name, we're also going to get the key term Zanj, which we'll talk about in a second. All right, so this is another example of what was going on in the rest of Africa at this time. Um, and we're talking about that place you see there in the orange. And again, another representation of where these city states were. The trade that was going on, like was, was mentioned, we know about, uh, this is a good image to look at. So you can see that the ancient world, so we're talking about the early uh, centuries of the first millennia. So the 100s, the 200s, the 300s, the 400s, the 500s. All of this trade is going on. People did not sit still in ancient times. People are going from Malaysia and Indonesia into the East African coast. You see Thailand and China. All of this is based off of the monsoon winds that carry. Let me see if I have a, uh, I don't have a, an image of that. But every year, there is a circular pattern of monsoon winds that take people to Africa and then ultimately from uh, November to February. Those winds take people to Africa. And then from April to October, those winds take you to Asia. So you can catch those winds, get to Africa, do your trading, take a rest, then get the winds and can go back home. So this was a highway and a perfect location for these African city states to grow rich off of the control of this trade going in and out of Africa. An example of some of these cities, we know this from the archaeological record. Uh, this is one of the ancient Swahili city-states in uh, Kenya, in southern Kenya. Kenya. Uh, this is the Getty site where you see uh, buildings were, were constructed. We know from this site the type of goods that were exchanged between people. We know about social hierarchy from the archaeological records. Some people were living well, the chiefs and the people of power, and then some people uh, you know, we're servants and different things. So we, we can see that in their graves and, and the things that they left behind. Again, these are the sources that, that we have. From the archaeological record, we know what was exported to the rest of the world. Gold. Very important. It's going to become even more important as the centuries go on. Ivory, of course. Elephant ivory, you know, rhinoceros horns, all these things. Going to China, especially. China had a thirst for, for ivory, for various things that they did. Tortoise shells, copper, iron, animal skins, live animals. There was a trade in live animals. And ambergeist, which is a, a fossilized resin uh, from trees that can be used to make perfumes. It was very expensive uh, in ancient times, and even today. Africans were importing porcelain from China, beads from India, cloth, ointments, perfumes, oils, silk from the great Silk Road trade that was happening in Asia. And we found all of this in the archaeological record in Kenya, in Tanzania, in Mozambique, and even uh, points further west in Congo, in the Great Lakes region around Burundi and, and Uganda and uh, uh, Rwanda, we found these items coming from Asia. So this is international trade. One of the most important items coming from Asia at this time, actually, is the banana. 
you might think, well, why is a banana so important? And all its variety, plantains and all that. This is going to change things in the Great Lakes region. It's because of the banana that the kingdom of Uganda emerges. We're going to talk about Uganda in a couple of weeks. But something as you know, simple as that can change world history. And it did. Uh, so very important time period that we're talking about. Uh, so these are the written records that talk about this. The, like we already mentioned, uh, the, the peripheral of the Erethian Sea, the Swahili Chronicles, Chinese records talk about East Africa at this time, Arab travelers, of course, Portuguese records, and then the oral history as well. Um, one of the earliest writings about this time period comes from an Arab traveler named Al Masudi. Al Masudi writes this great text called uh, Metals of Gold and Mines of Gems, where he talks about the East African coast. And he's writing around the year 900. And he talks about, just like we saw in the uh, Peripolis, he talks about the makeup of these city states, how they were organized, the types of trade that they were engaged in. And he actually traveled there. A lot of these Arab travelers wrote about their travels. They didn't actually travel anywhere. They based it off secondary uh, accounts. But he actually went from his hometown in Baghdad, in modern day Iraq, to the East African coast. And he saw the interactions. And then he, he noted that, oh yeah, one of these city states was actually run by a Muslim. Which means at the time, 900, most of these city states weren't run by Arabs. They were still under control of the Bantu people. And the Bantu people still held on to their traditional religious beliefs. It's gonna take a while before Islam becomes the main religion and the main organizing principle. And then people are going to start changing their genealogies. And it becomes really interesting along the Swahili city coast because people, when Islam becomes such a strong dominating uh, religious force and then the Arabs become such a strong political force, people start changing their genealogies. Chiefs, instead of saying that they're Bantu, start to say that, oh yeah, my ancestors were a companion of the prophet or we were Persian. Even to this day, in 2023, you can find people in Tanzania, in Kenya, uh, in Mozambique that will say that their ancestors came from Persia. Now, the archaeological record, the oral history doesn't support any of that. I mean, the, the written record, but th that has become part of the narrative because of the dominance of the Arab uh, 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 presence in this region. Uh, but Al Masudi, who's writing at the time in 900, was like, nah, there's only one <laughs> chieftain that's a Muslim. Everybody else is, is uh, practicing their traditional religion. He talks about the peace of the place. Not a lot of conflict. People are about their business. They're about making money. This is one of the international centers of economic activity in the world. So all these goods coming in, the chiefs are making sure that the, the people that live in the towns are taken care of. They're making sure that the travelers that come into the towns are taken care of. They had COVID restrictions, well, not COVID <laughs> restrictions, but they had restrictions back in the day. You couldn't just come into these cities. If you were a traveler coming from India, coming from China, and it wasn't because, again, they weren't prejudiced against Chinese people. They were prejudiced against anybody coming in because they said you might have disease. So instead of us opening up the town for you to just come in and bring all your germs, you got to quarantine for a while. Once we realize you're not sick, then you can come into the town. They had a whole island just for people to stay and so that you, we could figure out if you're sick or not. Because Africans weren't going to do what Europeans did. Europeans didn't let everybody come in. That's how they got the Black Death and the bubonic plague in, in their ports and Venice and all these other places. Said, no, 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 no. You got to stay here, quarantine, then we'll allow you to come in and trade. But they took care of the people. It was safe. One thing that the Arab travelers that go throughout Africa during this time in the early centuries of the first millennium, they all write about the safety, about the cleanliness of the cities, about the piety of the people, how much they believed in their spirituality and how much they interacted with each other on, on a peaceful level. So that's very uh, important to note. And Al Masudi talks about all of this in his book. Um, all right, then we got the Chinese that talk about East Africa and the magical animals that came out of East Africa. This is from one of the Chinese records, probably from the travels, uh, later travels of Admiral Xing Ho, uh, who brought back uh, giraffes to uh, China. You imagine you've never seen a giraffe before. You would think it was magical too. If you never saw the giraffe, you've never seen a picture of one, and if somebody brings this animal that looks like this with the little horns and so on, you would think it's magical too. Uh, so the Chinese talked about the East African trade and the things that came out of East Africa. The last thing I want to talk about before we take a break is the oral history. 
that recounts this time period. And a very famous story of this transition uh, from a predominantly Bantu culture to one more heavily influenced by Islam and Arab culture. Not that Islam and Arab culture took over completely, but the ruling classes became much more uh, uh, Arabized. And that was for you know, economic purposes, largely. They say, oh, well, the Arabs are controlling this region. Maybe I should convert to Islam. I have a better opportunity to engage in some trade, and make some money. But then it ultimately became, you know, some people did convert because of a true religious conviction, but then some people converted because they wanted that money. They wanted that, that, that business relationship. Uh, so this tale, the tale of Fumo Leongo Wabaori, um, is one of the most well-known tales of this region. He's like the African Robin Hood, as they say. I hate to compare Africans to Europeans. He's more like the Swahili. Uh, he's more like the Swahili Sunjata. There's a lot of epic tales in Africa of rulers who use their wit and their strength and their uh, uh, colleagues to assist them in, you know, fulfilling their missions. Uh, he is the East African Sunjata. So Fumo Liango Wabuari. Scholars aren't sure when this uh, poet, this potential ruler of, of the Pate Kingdom, uh, actually lived. It was at the 800s, the 900s, it was it sometime closer in the 12th, uh, the 13th century, or the, up, up until even the 1600s. People are, are debating this. But what the tale does show us is this transition between the Bantu culture and an Arab-dominated culture. So the, the, the poem, the oral history about him also contains poems that are ascribed to him, that he wrote about himself. So you know this is a black man. While he's doing all these feats, he's also rhyming. <laughs> he's writing these poems about himself and his exploits. So Fumo Liango is, is, is a great character. But he was supposed to inherit one of the kingdoms on the Swahili city coast. And this is one of the examples of the cultural transition. He had a cousin named Daudi. Now, Daud was the son of the previous ruler. But if you know about Bantu traditions throughout Africa, it's not usually the direct son of the king that takes over. It's usually the king's sister's son because it's a matrilineal succession. The king had to be related to the royal family through the mother. That's, you see that throughout West Africa, Central Africa, and parts of East Africa. However, somehow, Daudi colluded with the uh, uh, Arab traders that were in the region and others. He had converted to Islam, and he was able to usurp the throne from his cousin, who was the rightful heir of the throne, because he was related to the king through the king's sister. This, Daudi wasn't uh, content with just being the king. He knew the popularity of Fumo Liango. And we know from the, the, the oral history, from the epic, and from what Fumo Liango said about himself in his poems, that he was a handsome guy, he was a tall guy, he was fit, people loved his charisma, he could talk, he could, uh, you know, uh, he could fight, he could do all these things. And of course, we have to say, okay, how much is this is people writing about him and how much is him writing about himself? But anyway, he was enough of a threat to his cousin that his cousin wanted him dead. First, his cousin tried to exile him. Then his cousin tried to kill him in all these different ways, using different people to try to kill him. He tried to get the Twa people to kill him. He tried to marry, he married him to uh, an Oromo woman. So we're seeing this Pan-African story. You got the Twa people come in. You got the Oromo people who are in Kenya and also in Ethiopia. Uh, he's bringing them into the conversation and he tries to get his, his cousin's new in-laws to kill him. All, none of these things work. So finally, he's able to arrest Fumo Leongo. Uh, and this is with a great part of the story. And this is where this takes place near the, the town of Delta in southern Kenya. Fumo Leongo's prison break is one of the most well-known epics in, 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 in East Africa. So Fumo Leongo gets arrested, and uh, he, he, said, he knows his cousin's going to kill him. And he tells his cousin, look, I know I'm going to die. Um, but uh, before you kill me, I need one thing. Please throw a party for me outside of the prison walls. That way, before I'm executed, I can just hear the music and the people partying one more time before I die. And the cousin says, okay, I'll honor that. While this is going on, while he's locked up, though, he has told 
the, his mother's maid uh, that she the mother should bake him a cake with a file in it so that he could start breaking his chains. Uh, and the mother's doing this because she was, was baking him cakes, but the guards were eating the cakes. So he said, make it an ugly cake this time. So that way that the guards won't eat it and they'll let me actually have the cake. So she bakes him this ugly cake with the file in it. He gets it, but he can't start scratching out his chains without the guards hearing him. So when the party's going on and they're drumming and the people are singing, because they love Fumo Young and they know he's unjustly you know, locked up, about to be executed by his cousin. They're singing, they're dancing. He's in there and breaking his chains but the guards can't hear it because of all the music. And then while the people are partying, all of a sudden they turn around and Fumo Liango is among them. And he's dancing and singing, and before the guards can get him, he's off and runs away. It's not until Daudi is able to convince Fumo Liango's son with his Oromo wife uh, to turn his back on his father and find the uh, secret to Fumo Liango's uh, mortality. How do you kill Fumo Liango? And his son actually stabs him with a, I think it's a copper dagger. Uh, and his father's like, why, why have you done this to me, son? Blah, 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 blah. It's a whole thing. It's an epic uh, uh, tale. Uh, but anyway, it shows the transition. It's more than just Fumo Liango. It shows the transition from Fumo Liango, who represents the Bantu culture and Bantu philosophy, to this emerging African Arab uh, uh, culture that's going to dominate the Swahili city coast in the, you know, at least the last uh, centuries of CE, uh, the first millennium. So up into the 1500s. And then there's another group that comes in, the Portuguese, but we'll get to that a little bit later. So let's take a break uh, very quickly before we uh, talk about uh, other things going on uh, in other parts of Africa at this time. So let's take a break and go to any questions. So, uh, Nana, are there any hands up or is there any questions in the chat? And if you're talking, you're on mute. I'm not sure if she... Nana, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Anything in the chat or are there any hands? Um, yes, Renford Thomas. Hello, are you present now? Yes, sir. Hello, morning again. Happy New Year to all. It bothers me, and I'm wondering, the more I attend these courses, the more frustrated I get. When you listen to the trade and the resistance, so on and so forth, and yet, we seem to be able to fall back and focus on the slave portion of our history. Mm. That's what seems to dominate us. And I'm trying to figure out what is it so ingrained, so dominant, so brutal that we just can't let go of that. Yeah, I think it's two things with that. Um, slavery is something that should be talked about and it should never be forgotten. The same way that the Holocaust is that the slogan for the Holocaust will never forget. Slavery is something that we should never forget. We should never forget colonialism either. But it's important for us to remember that that's only the last 500 years of our uh, 5,000 years of recorded African history. Not all of African history, just recorded African history. So it's only one-tenth of our history. Nine-tenths of it don't involve slavery and colonialism, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to start the day with this African conversation. We're all going to talk about enslavement today. But even when you do talk about enslavement, you have to talk about resistance as well, which is another thing that we don't do. Um, but the focus primarily on enslavement, um, particularly in the Americas, and particularly in the US and Canada, it, do, it is um, disheartening. And it's why I try, when, especially when I talk to young people, is to never start with that. Because that's not the beginnings of our history, and that's not the dominant portion of our history. It's something to be remembered, it's something to study, but it's not the end all, be all of our history. You know, it's like a human life. You know, we go through different things in our lives, but we don't focus on the bad things. We look at them, we study them to make sure that they don't happen again, and to figure out the, the resilience and the ways that we resist those things. But there's so many other things, aspects in our lives that have occurred 
that we we focus on. Same thing with the history of a people. Um, so yeah, I understand, I share your frustration because yeah, that is the conversation that comes up a lot. And when we get to February, that will be one of the main things in the conversation. And I hate that because slavery is often talked about without resistance as well. So you get this almost history of yeah, black people were enslaved and they were tortured and they were beaten. Uh, but then one day, uh, slavery was over and black people should be happy that it's over and they should be making progress ever since. Yeah, no, nah, that's not the best way to teach history. It's not, it's, it's, it's a destructive way to teach history. Um, and you got to think about the black children in class where February might be the only month that they actually even get the history talked about. And you're going to talk about the most tragic moment of their history. You know, that's like, uh, you know, your favorite sports team, you only talk about the time that they lost the big game. What about the, all the victories they had? Like, I'm from Pittsburgh. The Steelers have won six Super Bowls. I don't talk about the Super Bowl from 1996 that they lost to Dallas. I don't want nobody bringing that up. No, let's talk about the ones that we won. Uh, so that's, I, I share your frustration. That's what these classes are trying to alleviate. Uh, so, yes, thank you for that comment. All right. that yes, sir. The fact that, uh, for instance, within Haiti, and just about all the superpowers at one time or another invaded Haiti. And yet, we seem to look for the oppressors for relief. Yeah. That also creates a problem. That it, it does. Again, this is another one of those things. If we knew history, then we would know what's going on in Haiti right now and the interference from the West that caused a lot of this. See, Without knowing the history, you would think that Haiti is just a lost cause, just a place of chaos, and that the West has to constantly come in and save Haiti, not realizing that the West is part of the reason why Haiti is in the chaos that it's in and supports this and keeps it chaotic so that it can keep exploiting Haiti. So you have to know that history. And in fact, again, connected to what I talked about earlier, if you really want to honor Dr. King, you should be out protesting Western interference in Haiti because King would be protesting that. We would be out protesting AFRICOM, the Africa, U.S. African Command that has military bases all over Africa. King would have been against that. So all of these things are important for us to, to, to know, to connect history to the contemporary period. Because without knowing the history, you look at these contemporary struggles and events and just believe the narrative that is given without all the background. You believe that Canada is somehow as benevolent uh, as power to Haiti, to parts of Africa, without realizing that, hey, wait a minute, Canada had a role in Patrice Lumumba's assassination. Canada had a role in the uh, abduction of uh, 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 Aristide. Canada had a role in this, that, and the third. And you start thinking, wait, wait a minute, how can you come and save? Well, at the same time, you are partially the cause. And what about these businesses that are operating? So all of this is, 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 is important for us to remember. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, no, no, anything in the chat? Any questions in the chat that folks wanted me to address? Sure. Let me check on this one. Okay, I just think some stuff's from the slide. All right. All right, so uh, this is just some conversation about the slide. So let's get back into it. Uh, well, any other questions or people? We'll get back into it. We'll get into it. Okay, no, I'll take Mr. Francis. Mr. Francis, go ahead. Morning, and uh, as um, Mr. Thomas said, Happy New Year. Um, the only comment I want to make, sir, is that. Uh, so many Western countries appear to be given aid to African countries. And I think it's so laughable. Because on the one hand, they're offering pittance, but behind the view back, they are taking on so much of the country. But yet, Ron, it's a public um, relation campaign that they have, one where you see things like religious organizations and NGOs are handing out, like, um, parcels of food to Africans and they're not mentioning the fact that so much of the natural resources of the country is being drained by this, those same people who are handing out gifts to them. 
Yes, sir. I can't say it any better. That's you're right. That's that's what we have going on. And it's for classes like this that we could constantly remind what happened so that we're not fooled by these types of things as they occur. All right. So uh, let's so we're going to move in a northeastern direction from the Swahili city state up to the Horn of Africa and Sudan. We talked about uh, the emergence of Islam and the Arab empire that was uh, resulting of the Arabs being unified uh, under Islam in the uh, 600s and in the 700s. Because prior to this, the Arabs were busy fighting themselves and other things. So it, it, Islam united them and they became a force. And Ultimately, by the time we get to the 900s, the you know 1,000, the 1100s, uh, we start to see that transition in East Africa. But it had already started in Northeast Africa in some places, uh, as well as making its way into uh, North and Northwest Africa. So we see from the time of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, there was no Arab Empire. Uh, this region, we already talked about this in, in part one, but it's, it's worth going over. This region was controlled by the Romans and the uh, Persians. They weren't even concerned about the Arabs because the Arabs were too busy fighting themselves. Once they're united by Islam, they bust out of the Arabian Peninsula. They take over all of these lands till we eventually get this, uh, where the Arabs are in control of much of this region. We talked about in our Shiro's class, as well as in uh, part one, uh, when the Arabs made their way into North Africa, they came up against the opposition of Dahia al Kahina, who was the uh, female uh, leader of the Amazigh, of the Berbers in North Africa, around Algeria and Tunisia, who put up spirited resistance against the Arabs until she was ultimately defeated. And much of her forces and other North African uh, and Northwest Africans converted to Islam, some out of religious conviction, but others because they didn't want to pay the tax. So the Arabs were smart. The Arabs were about creating an empire, converting people to Islam was secondary. So this is not, it, we shouldn't call it an Islamic empire, even though it was a, a caliphate. It was controlled by uh, the descendants of, 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 the, of the successors of the prophet, but it was really an Arab empire. It was an empire like any other empire, it just happened to be Islamic. So when this occurs, if you just convert people to Islam, does you you can't exploit them as much because there's only so, according to you know, the Quran, there's certain things you can't do to Muslims, other Muslims. You're not supposed to kill other Muslims. You're not supposed to enslave other Muslims. But if the people aren't Muslim, then you can enslave them. You can kill them. You can do different things. Uh, and more importantly, if they're not Muslim, if you control the area, you can force these people to pay a tax to practice their religion. So it's, it's, a, it's a slick form of religious tolerance. Like, well, you will be tolerant to your religion but you got to pay a tax if you want to practice your religion, whether it's Christianity, whether it's Judaism, whether it's traditional African religion, you got to pay a tax. And then that tax money helped to bring more wealth into the Arab empire. So again, they weren't interested in automatically converting people to Islam. They'd rather you stay practice your religion and pay the tax. But some Africans got hip to this and said, well, I'll just convert to Islam, even if it's just nominally, and I'll practice whatever I want to practice behind closed doors which created a, uh, these various versions of Islam throughout West and North Africa that are a little bit different than the Sunni and even the Shia Islam uh, practiced in the East. So by the time the uh, Arab armies are about to take over Al-Andalus or take over what was now Portugal and Spain, that army is primarily African. That army is primarily African. So this army, that crosses uh, the, the Mediterranean, right here, where Africa and Europe almost kiss. And right now we call this the, the Straits of Gibraltar, which is named after General Tariq, the North African, Northwest African general who led the troops to take over Spain and Portugal. These troops and the people that came along with them, again, mostly North and Northwest African, became known in Europe as the Moors the Moors. A lot of the generals, a lot of the uh, leaders were Arabs, but most of the troops, most of the people that were there were North and Northwest Africans. And when these Moors came into, and they were mostly Amazigh, 
So they were Berbers. They were people from what's now Mauritania, uh, some from even as far south as Senegal. Um, these are the people that took over Spain and Portugal in 711. Um, uh, we already talked about Alcina. So this is Al Andalus, and they named the place Al Andalus. Uh, so this area was used to be a part of the Roman Empire. We talked in previous classes about you know Hannibal's armies being in Spain, but this is the time period from 711 to 1492 that these Africans and, and Arabs controlled Europe. Uh, it's something that's not talked about a lot. You know, uh, the Moors in Europe changed European history because they brought so many things into Western Europe. Now this time period that they control Europe, for a lot of this time period, historians used to call this Europe's dark ages. These were the middle ages. Then. This is after the fall of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire in the West fell, uh, they say usually around 500 CE. Um, it's still pretty strong in the East. That's the Byzantine, Byzantine uh, Roman Empire. But in the West, in France and Spain and, and, and Britain, uh, the Roman Empire has pretty much collapsed. Um, the learning that was associated with the Roman Empire, which had uh, built off the foundations of the Greeks, a lot of that stuff went away. A lot of you know, superstitions came back into practice. A lot of things, really anti-scientific time period right before Europe had its renaissance, its rebirth. Renaissance means rebirth in Italy and in other places. The Moors were responsible for holding on to a lot of that knowledge about Greek philosophy, about science, about different things that the, Europe's were, the Europeans were, in Western Europe were forsaking at the time. And it wouldn't be until the Renaissance that they reconnected with that stuff. It was the Moors that taught in their universities in Spain and in Portugal. Greek philosophy, Arab philosophy, African philosophy. They taught science, they taught mathematics, Islamic law. Um, they practiced religious tolerance in Spain and Portugal. They didn't have as heavy of a tax as they had in other places. So Christians could still practice, Muslims could practice, Jews could practice. And there were a lot of Jewish people uh, in uh, Spain and Portugal at this time. So uh, this is just a statue of, of General uh, Tariq, who uh, Gibraltar is named after. Uh, we you see the Rock of Gibraltar there. Uh, so education, architecture. If you go to Spain today, you can see the architecture of the Moors who used the know-how of the Africans with the techniques of the Arabs. So the Moors were able to connect knowledge that was coming all the way from Persia, all the way through uh, the learning centers in Alexandria, and even connected, you don't see it on this map, but further south, to the University of St. Corre at the city of Timbuktu in the, in the Mali and the Songhai empires in West Africa. They were able to take all of this knowledge and bring it into Europe, in the universities, where European scholars study and learn from the Moors. Like I said, religious tolerance, engineering, new crops were, were grown in, in, in Spain and Portugal. So this was a 700 year period where Africans controlled Europe. Well, a part of Europe, part of Western Europe. Very important. Because when they're kicked out in 1492, completely, January 1st, 1492, the Moors are, and this is a gradual process of uh, the reconquering of Europe, the reconquista. And then we see all types of brutality come out, uh, out of Spain at this time. This is when the Inquisition happens, after they retake over uh, from the Moors, uh, and they expelled Jews out of Spain and forced people to convert to Christianity. They kick all the Muslims out. Um, and then they start exploring the places that the Moors told them about. So the Portuguese are out of the Moors' control first. And then they start exploring West Africa because all the things that the Moors had told them about the gold in West Africa and these cities of gold and these places. They start exploring the ocean the way that the Moors had taught them how to navigate the stars and all of these things. So a lot of great Moorish contributions that ultimately come back to bite Africa in, uh, in the butt uh, in these decades following. They take the technology of the Moors, they take the maps of the Moors, all these things, and then you know, we started seeing enslavement and things happen. We'll get into that a little bit later. But this is a great time period to study, the Moors in Al-Andalus. Um, so while, all, while this is happening in the West, and Africans and Arabs are in control of Spain and Portugal, at the same time, Africans are being enslaved in the Persian Gulf. And these Africans are coming from East Africa. So, so 
we're going to talk about slavery, but we're not talking about the slavery to the West. We're talking about slavery to the East, because as the the Arabs were united under Islam and this empire grows, Africans start to be imported to the West, to Persia, to India, and even as far east as, as, as Japan. Uh, but primarily what we're going to talk about today is the Persian Gulf, this area of modern day Iraq uh, and Iran. And this is an area where Africans were taken to from East Africa. Um, and it's a better map here. And you see this town here, right here. This area, right where the Persian Gulf meets and the Tigris and Euphrates spread. This is where in southern Iraq and today, there is an Afro-Iraqi population based off of the people that were brought here in the 800s, the 700s and the 800s. Very important. One of the most important African scholars that emerged in this period, who wasn't a slave, his parents might have been uh, enslaved and he possibly was from either Somalia or Ethiopia or possibly even Kenya, but he was a Zanj. He was from East Africa. Zanj is what the Arabs called East Africa, south of uh, um, Sudan. So again, it goes back to that word Azanya, so Zanj or Zinj. Uthman uh, Emir Ibn Bahir, also known as Al Jahiz. Al Jahiz means googly eyed because he had a condition where his eyes kind of like shot out. But he was a genius, a multi-genius. He grew up in Basra, uh, in southern Iraq. But as, like I said, his, father, his family was from East Africa. He was a scholar. He was uh, responsible for educating a lot of the uh, children of the wealthy uh, Arabs in the Persian Gulf. And he wrote a number of books. And one of his books, he writes, is called The Glory, The Book of the Glory of the Black Race. Because all the way back in the 700s and in the 800s, because of the trade in Africans to the Persian Gulf, Arabs had developed a superiority complex bordering on racism. Actually, we could call it racism. But they would write all these things about East Africans, how they looked how they smelled, the lack of intelligence, all these different things, staples that we would find in uh, future iterations of anti-black racism. But he writes this book, and he dispels all of that. He says, I'm Zanj. I'm a man of intellect. My brothers and sisters that I know that are Zanj are great intellect, were great poets, were great scholars, were good-looking people. He writes all of this stuff to refute Arab racism all the way back in the ninth century. He also writes another book, another very important, called The Book of Animals, which you might think, okay, why is that important? It's just about the Book of Animals. He writes this book in the 800s. The 800s, thousands of years, a thousand years before um, Charles Darwin. And in this book, he talks about a theory of evolution of how certain animals have to adapt to the environments that they're in, and then that adapt, uh, adaption takes on the certain physical characteristics to help them survive in the places that they live. This was an idea that Darwin would have a thousand years later become famous off of, but it was talked about by this African man in Southern Iraq in the 800s, as opposed to the 1800s in his book of animals. So he was a multi-genius, and he actually dies in 868. Very important year. He dies right before one of the most important events happens in this region. Because remember I said, when we talk about enslavement, we have to talk about resistance. So when the Africans were brought to Basra, and this is a good book that talks about everything I'm talking about, the revolt of the African slaves in Iraq. Because a lot of people don't know this story. They don't know that one of the largest revolts against, successful revolts against enslavement happened not in the Americas. It happened in Iraq. And there were millions of Africans that were taken to Iraq. So in this time, uh, what the, the Arabs were trying to do, they were trying to uh, irrigate this part of uh, southern Iraq. And it was a big uh, project because in this marsh, the, the, the area is where the rivers meet, the Tigris and the Euphrates meet, and there's all these other areas, and it's very covered with marshes. And there is a layer above the soil. Before you can farm on the soil, you have to get rid of this thick layer of nitrates, like salt, and, and you can't grow anything in it. So you have to remove that. And then once you remove that, the area becomes very fertile. You can grow different crops and, 
is a, a, a great area for agricultural development. But the hard labor is removing that nitrate. And the Arabs didn't want to do it, so they said, we got to get some enslaved people. So that's when they go to East Africa and to those Swahili city states, and they start asking for labor. And uh, this is when the slave trade begins. And a lot of the newly Arabized chieftains of the Swahili city states are now the people like Daudi, who Fumo Liango was fighting against. He's the one that's working with these Arabs from the Persian Gulf and these Persians. So it's not, they're not all Arabs. Some of them were Persians uh, who are looking for slave labor. Because of this, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Africans go to southern Iraq and are enslaved in that regard. During the nitrate, a lot of women are enslaved. In fact, this, this slavery that's going to uh, the West, that's going to continue. So it's going to stop in Iraq, but it's still going to continue to places like India and Persia and Arabia uh, and Turkey, of course. Um, much of this slavery was sexual slavery. The slavery that went to the West, the plantation slavery, and the thing that we're most familiar with, you have more men that went to the West. This slavery, two thirds of the picture was slavery. Concubine ships. A lot of people in this region of the world had harems where they would, you know, have Ethiopian women, Somali women, Kenyan women, and sex slavery. A lot of the men were actually enslaved and sexualized in a different way. They became eunuchs, where their job was to guard these harems of these uh, great sultans and rulers in, in, in Asia and in parts of Europe. And these men would have their testicles uh, castrated so that they couldn't copulate with the women in the harem. But we'll get into that in a couple of weeks because those men become incredibly important political figures. It's very strange how that happens, but it does. Uh, but in the case of Basra, this is very much like plantation style slavery. So a lot of men, there are some women that are enslaved for domestic purposes, but mostly men that have been taken to Basra. Um, this book by Popovich is one of the only English texts that talks about this revolt, uh, the revolt of African slaves in Iraq. It's called the Zanj Rebellion. And ultimately, because of the backbreaking labor, the brutality of the labor, the Africans organized. And they also organized with a guy that was from India, uh, who was also a servant there. So this was a multiracial uprising, but it was led by the Africans, by the Zan. That's why it's called the Zan's Rebellion. And in 869, they rise up and they slaughter their masters and overseers in southern Iraq. And not only that, they start taking over territory. So it wasn't just about getting free. It's also like, OK, well, let's take over. Let's start our own kingdom, which they did. You see how long this lasted? From 869 to 884, they controlled southern Iraq. They had what would later be called quilombos. They had war camps. They were uh, master strategists of forming defenses. They were ultimately defeated uh, once the folks in northern Iraq got to act together, became stronger, and they actually crushed it. But when they did, when they crushed the Zan's rebellion, they made a proclamation. They said, we can never let this happen again. No more large-scale importation of Africans. So this stopped this trade of East Africans in, in large numbers in this region of the world. This is why we don't have a large African diaspora in Iraq and Iran. There is a, a good-sized one, but it would have been like the West had it not been for the Zan's Rebellion that, con that convinced the Iraqis to say, you know what, uh, this is way too much trouble. Uh, you know, getting killed by these Africans, because these are the type of images that people still remember from the Zan's Rebellion. The Africans chopping off people's heads, putting their heads on sticks. I mean, they really did a number on southern Iraq to the point that they said, it's not worth it. We're not enslaving any more Africans. So although, you know, we don't have an African kingdom in southern Iraq anymore, the way that the Zanj had created, they were successful in that they stopped Africans from being, uh, uh, you know, imported into Iraq in that way. But that's the, really the start of the African diaspora in Asia. It's going to continue over the next 1,000 years, but never to the extent of the numbers of Basra. So that's uh, really important. When we come back next week, we're going to talk about, uh, not this, uh, that's way in the future. We're going to talk about other events 
in uh, Africa. And we're going to go in that, again, that counterclockwise direction. We're going to talk about Mali because this is going to be an example of Africans, again, transitioning from a traditional African base to incorporating elements of Islam. But in the case of Mali, they incorporate Islam, but they don't incorporate Arab culture, which is a very, it's a different thing. Because we have to talk about the separation between Islam and Arab culture. They're not, one emerges from the other, but they're not necessarily the same thing. So when we talk about Mali next week in West Africa, we'll see those differences. Uh, and we'll talk about Sunjiata Keita. So we talked about Fumo Liango in the oral history around him. Next week, we'll talk about Sunjiata Keita in the oral history around his epic, which is in West Africa. So that's where we'll stop today. Uh, we'll open it up to any uh, questions and general discussion and announcements. Um, so before we get open up the floor, let me make a couple of announcements. Um, a lot of events will be happening uh, in a few weeks when Black History Month starts. I know Black History Ottawa has uh, a number of events. You can go to their social media pages and their websites to check out what they have going on. As I know they have an opening, I think, on January 28th um, to celebrate the opening of Black History Month. Jaku Combat, uh, we are having a number of events. Uh, the mentorship program is meeting January 28th uh, at 2.30 at uh, the Bronson Center. So if there's any young people that you know that are looking for work between the ages of 14 and 22, we're having an employment pool. But in order to get into that pool for possible employment with either Jaco Combin or some of our partners, um, you need to show up at this meeting so that you can register. Uh, and it's also a community build session. So if you're interested in becoming a mentor, you can come out to that meeting. That's January 28th, 2.30 p.m. at the Bronson Center on 211 Bronson Avenue. Ne uh, today, um, I think uh, today's the 14th. Yeah, there is a 613 hub meeting at the Bronson Center uh, in room 215. And I'm not sure what time that is, but somebody in the chat may know. Uh, so there's a lot of things going on and uh, all positive, And we'll keep you updated on those events as they come. So uh, let's go into the chat. So I see Robin has his hand up. And now if you could. Look at the chat and let me know if there's any questions uh, while Robin is, is, is talking. No questions. Okay. So, Robin, go ahead. Uh, well, of course, Happy New Year, man. Happy to you and the family. Yes, sir. Uh, the, thank you for mentioning the hub meeting. It's actually it's 1 o'clock. It is in room okay. 103, the same room that you uh, use for the mentoring program at, okay. at the Bronson Center. Yeah. And it's a, a volunteer recruiting. <laughs> Meeting so um, and uh, back in L, uh, the black owned restaurant uh, is flying with food like you did last night. So awesome. Um, yes, yeah, yeah. Your lectures are so great and they always trigger comments. So um, so on the idea of watering down Martin Luther King's memory. So um, oh tomorrow <laughs> tomorrow is the annual Dream Keepers event uh, at City Hall. This is an event run by white people and um, <laughs> does pretty much what you're talking about. It, 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 it celebrates this kind of watered-down version of MLK. None of the radical stuff, right? It, it all highlighted and they, you know, they give it awards. It's awards that people do good work, but not nobody who's doing anything that's really fundamentally challenging the system and causing it. <laughs> right? So, yeah, so that's that, right? So, um, and then your, I got a personal story, but you mentioned when you're dealing like with legal things, you have to have evidence, right? And I was gonna give a little fun, personal story that shows the inconsistency there in, in that I've experienced in the, in the system here, right? So, um, so, uh, <laughs> so I'm suing a guy, okay? Black guy, actually. Okay, I'm suing two black guys. And, um, uh, and they counter suit, which is what happens. Right? So, the in order to um, so okay, so it's basically this, this is a small claims court. Okay, so so let's assume one guy he doesn't file a defense. When that happens, you can then have the person found in default, right? Which means they haven't filed a defense. And then you go, you try to collect. So I was only to sue this guy for like six grand, and and I went to the judge and I had. I had receipts and I had evidence, right? And the judge still said, yeah, not fully convinced. And I gotta admit, I was kind of uh, pleased to see that, that the, the, the 
seen the system was set up in a way that you, you can't easily like mm. go against those monitors. But then get this. The other guy comes with me and I failed to follow, follow the fence just because like I had so many th- I, I literally thought I had followed the fence, but but hadn't because I had so many people in the nose. Anyway, so this guy then goes to the judge and makes the case he basically said, Hey, I'm in default um I want him to give me thirty-five thousand dollars. The judge says, "Yeah, okay." So, so this guy get, well, without, without, and I, I know the guy has no evidence. He has no evidence based on um, on the law, and certainly nothing to justify the thirty-five thousand. But just to let you know, so right now this guy is, has a legal uh, decision. Right? Like, I, like, I can't hold to like the in my like the, the documents that where he's going to try to garnish my wages and, and send the sheriff to, 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 to take shifts. <laughs> so anyway. I've got that cover on it, but, but, but it was a, it's a, again, an example of how the system you're supposed to have evidence, but in some cases, no. Nope. <laughs> right? So it's like, wow. So that, and all to say, the reason that that relates to the hub is I'm actually going to file a complaint after, after my personal stuff is over. I'm going to file a complaint on behalf of the hub with the Attorney General of Ontario because this, this, this guy being able to do this, and he's got a black guy, I'm thinking, oh my God, like white people could totally use this against black people. You can just create a lawsuit and then if, 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 you know, for some reason the black person doesn't follow the fence and you can just go and make up any bullshit and say, yeah, fine, it'll be 35,000. Yeah, you know, but it, it's incredibly dangerous, right? So, um, yeah, so I'm gonna, after this is over, I'm going to file that complaint at that, with the Attorney General of uh, Ontario about this whole problem with the system. Okay, yeah, uh, keep us updated, definitely. Uh, <clears throat> any other questions or comments or announcements, events? Uh, things going on in the community that folks want us to know about before we close out. Any questions, comments, final things? I don't see any. All right. So next week uh, we will uh, uh, reconvene. So everybody stay well and we'll talk soon.